Right, straight into this one. First things first, two five ones. What are they? Where did they come from? Where do they go? Where did you come from? Where did you- Stop. We've just started. That one didn't even make any sense. So if you're not really interested in music theory stuff, then hopefully you can still get something from this video, but it is very much a theory video. If you feel like you already get the basic stuff on this, uh, just skip on ahead. There are timestamps in the description uh, to take you to the more interesting stuff. But if this is your first time hearing of 251s, or if you feel like you need a short refresher, here you are. A 2-5-1 progression is simply a chord progression that uses the second chord in a key, then the fifth, which then resolves to the first chord. In the key of C, this would be D minor, being the two chord, built from the second note in the scale, then the G, the five chord, then the C chord, which is our one chord, or root chord, or tonic chord. There are a few different names for the same thing. What makes 2-5-1s work so well and so popular is the basic principle of moving down a perfect fifth, or in inversion, it's basically the same thing, up a perfect fourth. The root note of D minor is the fifth from G, and G in turn is the fifth from C. So in a 2-5-1 progression, you get two consecutive 5 to 1 motions. 2, 5 to 1. The 2 resolves to the 5, the 5 resolves to the 1. This gives us some nice smooth harmonic motion and it just sounds natural and nice. And why is that? Well, because that's just how Western harmony uh, for the most part works. I'm not going to be able to explain it all in just this video. It's just one of the basic principles of Western music, really. One of resolving via perfect fifth motion. So the five chord, we call it the dominant chord, points us back to the one chord or the tonic chord. Expanding this principle one step further takes us to the five of the five chord, which is the two. The two chord therefore points to the five chord and the five chord points to the one. Nice. And yes, we can of course expand the principle further still to the fifth of that, which is six, two, five, one. Or we could notice that the one chord itself is the fifth of the four chord. And this can go on and on and on, but that's not important right now. Two, five, one progressions are of course most famously used in jazz, but they have a history going back further than that, at least to Bach. They are just great for really pointing at the tonic or towards a new one, thanks to that repeated 5-1 resolving motion. Everyone from Bach to Miles Davis to Paul McCartney, Stevie Wonder, I mean virtually everyone honestly has used that repeated perfect fifth motion to great effect. Now remember, like anything in music, 2 5 ones are pretty much an endless journey of discovery and frustration. So in the grand scheme of things, this video of mine is only going to be very cursory, but hopefully an interesting exploration anyway. Right, let's look at some pop and rock songs that use two five ones. We'll start with simple examples that we'll only very quickly touch on, and then we'll move on to the more interesting stuff. So a really straightforward example of a two five one in pop music is Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles. The verses of this song are pretty much just 2-5-1 around and around in the key of D-flat. There's the odd little uh, extension or sus chord thrown in, like the A-flat sus4 going to the A-flat, but it is still just 2-5-1 through those verses. Because the 2 chord is a minor 7th chord, that E-flat minor, which is the 2 chord, can easily be heard as or just played as a G-flat or even a G-flat 6. Uh, and a lot of places online do seem to list it that way. To my ear though, it is a minor 7 chord, uh, though it is hard for me to tell at the speed it's played. Kind of doesn't matter either. 2 5 ones and 4 5 ones are really fundamentally almost the same thing. It's predominant, then dominant, then the tonic. And that's simply just down to the fact that those two different chords, the 4 and the 2, share so many notes. Uh, to briefly explain, let's say we're in a key of C, the two chord, uh, D minor, is D, F, and A, and the four chord, which is an F, is F, A, C. So that F and A are in both chords. So there's a fair bit of overlap then. Turn that D minor into a D minor seven, and you've essentially really just got an F chord over a D bass. So yeah, basically the same chord except when it's not. I guess the first thing to keep in mind then is that quite often, wherever you want to use a 2-5-1, you could also in many places just use a 4-5-1 because they share so many notes in common and they have ultimately a very similar sound. Again, it's that predominant, dominant, tonic kind of movement. So another good example of a pretty straightforward 2-5-1 use in music is Gary Moore. 
as in just loads of Gary Moore's stuff. Uh, he loved 251s sometimes. He would just simply use them uh, as a way to kind of spice up a 12 bar blues. Um, but then there's Parisian Walkways and Still Got the Blues, which are probably his two most famous songs, full stop, actually, but also his two most famous uses of 251s. Both of these songs are almost entirely just circle of fifths motions. Uh, it's basically just perpetual 251s in a way. Unlike uh, the Buggles song, Video Killed the Radio Star, though, both Parisian Walkways and Still Got the Blues are in minor keys. Uh, both of them are in A minor. So, look, if we do a diatonic circle of fifths chord progression in any key, you're going to pretty much by definition get a little 2-5-1 at the end or throughout, depending how you look at it. The whole diatonic circle of fifths in a major key, after all, is just our major tonic, major chord on the four, we have the diminished chord on the seven, then we have a minor chord on three, minor chord on six, minor chord on two, dominant chord on the fifth chord, then we go back to the root, then we go around again to the fourth chord, and then from there we go to the seventh, around and around and around. But as I just said, Gary seems to have a strong preference for the minor version, which makes sense for the kind of bluesy stuff that he played. So that would be the minor chord built off the one, then the minor chord on the four, then we have a major chord built off a of flat seven, major chord off a of flat three, flat six major chord, and then we have that diminished two chord, and then we have, uh, we could do a minor chord on the fifth chord, but it's usually going to be a um, major or dominant chord, then we have the minor one, then we have the minor four, and again, just like the major diatonic circle of fifths, it goes on and on and on. Gary just loves this. But a much, much more famous example of the same minor 251 is the Beatles song, You Never Give Me Your Money from Abbey Road. You break this song was written by Paul McCartney, who also just really loves 251s. This song is also in A minor, and it uses a very similar chord progression to what we already heard in Gary's songs. Pretty much just going through that diatonic circle of fifths in a minor key. What's really important to point out here though is the fact that just like Gary Moore's 251s, Paul uses that dominant seven or major chord on the five, not the naturally occurring uh, minor five chord in a minor key. This is of course pretty standard, turning the fifth chord in a minor key into a dominant chord, i.e. with a major third rather than a minor third, is pretty much a given and it's almost not worth pointing out. It's probably more common than leaving as it is, to be honest. Uh, you gotta get that juicy leading tone after all. But I do just mention it here as it's probably one of, if not the most common way of sort of bending without breaking a scale. So in the key of A minor, as the Beatles song and the two Gary Moore songs that we just mentioned are, uh, if we want our four chord, E minor, to have a major third instead, we simply sharpen the seventh scale degree, which is the G, making it a G sharp. Cool. So now that E minor is actually an E chord, and if we add in the seventh, the D, we have a dominant seven chord. But it's not just in minor keys that we can do this scale tweaking. Applying that same principle to major keys, say on the two chord in a major two five one, is basically just how we get secondary dominance, right? So if we do want to turn that two chord from a minor into a seventh chord or just a major, uh, we would take the minor third and we would turn that into a major third from the second scale degree uh, while keeping the flat seven if we want to include a seven. This then would give us a secondary dominant to the dominant. A D7 doesn't naturally appear in the key or scale of C, but it only takes that little change, sharpening the F to an F sharp, to give us one, and this really just strengthens the motion to five. It's the five of the five. And luckily for us, if we use that alongside the G and the C, if we're in the key of C again, it's still a 2-5-1. Uh, this sort of 2-5-1 is also really common, and to me, it's just dripping with the sound of like America, which is no coincidence. In this form, it's most commonly known as, especially if we keep extending the principle out to the sixth chord uh, to give us two secondary dominance, it's known as the ragtime progression. A great example of this is a song I've actually already uh, made a video about. Wow, what are the chances? The I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die Rag or Fish Cheer by Country Joe and the Fish. This song is so very ragtime. Just hear that ragtime progression with the secondary dominant from two, five, and then to one. 
it's basically just this perpetual kind of circle of fifths motion. A more famous example, probably the most famous example out there is the Bare Necessities from Jungle Book, which just uses the same ragtime progression and that secondary dominant 251 to give it a very kind of New Orleans or Dixieland kind of jazz feel. Forget about your worries and your stress. I mean Both songs also use secondary dominance as far as the sixth chord, in fact. Right. So, so far, we've not actually looked at any 251s being used to modulate. We've just looked at those which point us back to the already established root. But using 251s to modulate is arguably the main use of the progression because it's such a strong motion with a clear gravity towards the one at the end. The use of 251s to change key might be taking all music, you know, jazz, classical, everything into account. It might be the most popular way of modulating and for a lot of music is simply the standard way of modulating. A really clear example in popular music that does this, and for now I'll just stick to one, is Billy Joel's New York State of Mind. This is just chock full of 251s. so easy living, living day by day, yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of touch. But it's the chorus where William Joel really starts to use those 251s to great effect. So we get one going to the G, then the G turns into a minor seventh chord of a new 251 taking us to F. Then we have another one starting on B minor seven, which is the third of the G, taking us eventually to A. Then that A becomes an A minor 7 to start off a new one taking us to G. And then the final 251 starts on D minor 7 taking us back to C of the verse. Phew. So that is a kind of quick tour of what 251s are and how they're used. It's cool stuff, but this is just the beginning of it really. Things get much more interesting when we start to look a bit deeper. So I'll go through some more examples that strike me as a little bit more unorthodox or unusual or cool. I mean, they're all cool, but obviously, again, this is in no way comprehensive or definitive. These are just some examples that I like. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share my video if you like my content. It would be really appreciated. Cheers. So in getting a bit deeper here, let's just start with a simple observation that the 2-5 part of a 2-5-1 can be and often is isolated by itself and just played on a loop in many popular songs. Let's say D minor to G, which could also be a D minor 7 to G7. This minor 1 to major 4 progression is the basis of loads of funk and disco. It's very popular in blues music as well. Pink Floyd use it, the Doors use it, the Beatles use it, the Grateful Dead use it. Loads of people use it. Of course though, where it's used in those songs, it's not really a 251, is it? It appears without the one after all. So when it's used in those songs, the two is essentially just the one, and the five isn't a five chord, it's actually the four chord. So really, we have a minor one chord to a major four. It's a sort of Dorian mode vamp, really. Rather than having a very distinctive functional harmony end point at the conclusion of a 2-5-1, we instead have a pretty static sounding two chord vamp. And that comparatively static feeling is key to its usefulness in funk and disco and jam bands. So the two things are actually quite distinct, really. Let's go back to it being in the key of C. Uh, if it's a 2-5-1, that would be D minor or D minor 7 to G or G7. And then, obviously, if it's a 2 5 one, it ends on C. Sometimes, though, that D minor to G movement wouldn't actually be a 2-5 of a 2 5 one. It would be a minor one to major four. They're not actually at all the same thing. But are there any songs that do both? Something that sounds like a simple Dorian 1 to 4 but ends up using the same two chords as a sort of 2 5 1 of some kind? Well, I think this does occasionally happen. I couldn't find many examples simply because I think the two ways of using this pattern are almost completely contradictory. 1 to 4 being pretty static and circular, whereas using the same two chords as a 2 to 5 gives a very clear sense of motion to a 1, which in the context of the Dorian Vamp would be a major chord built off the flat 6. But I have found a handful. One good one, I think, is the Loving Spoonful's Summer in the City. 
The chorus starts with a straightforward one to four in F for the first few lines. But the night is different world. Go out and find a girl. Come on, come on. Then we go for a little two chord vamp on the relative minor, D minor. But at this point, we don't get a natural minor chord vamp here at all. We get that Dorian minor one to major four, and it's D minor to G. It's not super long at all, but I do think it's long enough to function by itself as that Dorian minor one to major four, before also being used as a two to five to one, modulating his back into that C minor of the verse. I think it really works well here, uh, but it's not for super long, as I just said. Paul McCartney's Uncle Albert might actually be an even better example of this. And that's because we do have just A minor to D for the first three lines. This is, just like all those Pink Floyd, Chic and Doors and other songs, uh, and the Loving Spoonful song, uh, it's a simple Dorian vamp, right? And it's in what a lot of people I think would casually call a Dorian. And that's exactly what it sounds like, minor one to major four, until that third D, which is then followed by a G minor seven. Uncle Albert, but there's no which means that the last one to four at least was also functioning as a two to five on its way to a one, right, with a minor tonic here. And then after that, we go right back into another two, five, one type movement straight away with a C after the G minor seven. No one left at home I... So this is maybe the start of a new two, five, one. Except it isn't actually. You might expect, if it were, to see an F at the end point there, but what happens here is from the C, it just kind of walks up back to that D, which leads us back into a G minor seven for the instrumental. Anyway, as I said, Paul McCartney in this song is doing a slightly more obvious version of what the Loving Spoonful briefly do. He's also using chords with what feels to me like overlapping functions. The A minor to D is, at first, a simple minor one to major four for a while, but then also eventually a two to five of a two five one. His two five ones also overlap a bit, and this is simply a very natural result of working through the circle of fifths, of course, but because he lingers briefly on each bit and he changes major chords into minor sevens, he's not just going through the circle of fifths, he's doing it in a way that gives us very obvious classic two five one motion too. On top of that, he's sort of misdirecting us at the end of the verses when he plays the G minor 7 to C, but then doesn't proceed on to F. It just moves chromatically to the D, as I said before, to take us back to the initial 1 to 4 Dorian vamp. But now it's in G minor 7. Wow, there's a, there's a lot of like little twists and turns in this kind of deceptively simple song. Because 251's point is so obviously in certain directions, choosing not to fulfill them can end up sounding quite in your face, which is what happens with that chromatic walk-up. I, I think it's kind of a cool effect, although I'm not necessarily a huge fan of the song as a whole. I think there are other kind of examples of this that I've heard in other songs, for example, Pink Floyd's Great Gig in the Sky, and maybe a couple Beach Boys tunes like All I Wanna Do, but I think they're a little bit more tenuous compared to the Love and Spoonful and Paul McCartney examples. As I said earlier, using, and let's just stick to the key of C as I always do because it's easier, D minor to G as a Dorian one to four is almost completely contradictory to using it as a two and a five in a two five one to C. So I think it's unusual for them to be used both ways in a song, but it does still happen and I think it can work. And I'm sure there are loads of examples I miss. I would definitely be interested to hear some you might know. Comment below if you do think of any. Now let's look at another slightly more out there 251. The use of Neapolitan sixths in pop music. Now this is very rare. It took a fair bit of digging around to find some proper examples that would fit in with what we're talking about here. Where we have the Neapolitan sixth chord, then a dominant chord, then a tonic chord. So I'm not going to explain to you right now the entire history and usage of uh, augmented chords in classical music. That would take an entire video or a few. We just need to get the gist of it for now. And that is simply that the Neapolitan chord is built on the flattened second scale degree and is a major chord. So in A minor, and it is more often than not used going to a minor tonic, 
that would be a B flat major chord. This B flat major works so well in the key of A minor as a predominant chord, precisely because it shares notes with the other predominant chords in a key. So in the key of A minor, that would either be B diminished or B half diminished, or D minor or D minor seven. So if we go Neapolitan six, dominant seven chord, then tonic, we essentially just have a flat two, five, one. It's a little more complex than that as it's usually played in inversion. And again, there are different types of augmented six, but let's not worry about that right now. We're talking about popular music, not classical. I think then that it's fair to call this maybe a Phrygian two, five, one. Phrygian is one of the standard modes of the natural major scale and is, to put it simply, just the minor scale, but we flattened the second note. So A Phrygian would sound like this. This means then that instead of a half diminished second chord, we have a major two chord on the flattened scale degree. If we keep the dominant seven chord on the five, we have a flat two, dominant seven to one, which is Phrygian two, five, one. Sounds really kind of classical in my mind. It kind of sounds old. So how often is this used in pop? Well, not very often at all, it's super rare. Using a major chord built off of the flat two isn't nearly as rare, but following it with the dominant seven chord on the fifth degree is. Nonetheless, I did find three great examples and a fourth kind of example. So example number one, it's the Beatles, as you might expect, it's always the Beatles, isn't it? Uh, do you want to know a secret from Please Please Me does this just once right at the start of the song? Never know how much I really so we're in the key of E minor to start. Uh, the Neapolitan six therefore is F and the dominant five chord is B7. And that's what we get. And that actually leads us into a verse in E major. Nice. The rest of the song has plenty of 251 action, but it's all standard major diatonic stuff really, and the Neapolitan chord doesn't reappear. But it's a great example using the Neapolitan 6 or Phrygian flat 2 to the dominant 5 movements to modulate from minor into major. My second example interestingly also only uses the Neapolitan 6 five, one movement once in the intro as well. And it's never used again throughout the entire song, preferring to go for, again, more common two, five, one moments as well. And this song is They Might Be Giants' Birdhouse in Your Soul. I really love this song. It's just super catchy. Uh, and the intro starts in C, then it quickly starts borrowing chords from the parallel key of C minor. Then we get a C minor. Then we go to the Neapolitan six. Then we get the five chord and into C major again for the verses. The thing is, both this tune and the Beatles song uh, both use the Neapolitan 6 uh, to 5 movement to take us back to a major tonic, but it's much more common in classical, where the Neapolitan 6 sees much more use, to go back to a minor tonic. And my third example does exactly that, while also using it much more throughout the song, and that's Lionel Richie's Hello. Hello. To tell you so much. Throughout the chorus, we really do just get loads of circle of fifths of motion. We get D minor, we get G, C, F, B flat, which is our Neapolitan six. Then we get an E sus four to E to A minor. And it's these last few chords where that Neapolitan six appears. B flat is the flat two uh, from A minor. And then E is our five chord back to A minor. So there's not really much more to say other than, yeah, he uses it. It sounds great and it's it's really good song. So I said that I also had a kind of example, and that is Joanna Newsom's Colleen. This time we're in the key of E minor, and we get the Neapolitan six chord, which here is F, um, but rather than going straight from F to the dominant chord, which in the key of E minor is B7, uh, Joanna plays the F, then takes it down a whole step, which is a D sharp, which itself is just half a step below the tonic chord. Um, so this is kind of a quite out there choice. It sounds quite jarring in the context of what is otherwise quite a straightforward, like folksy sounding song, but it, it works, it sounds really cool. So we get that F, the uh, Neapolitan six, 
then we get a D sharp major chord, then we get the dominant chord built off of B, and then we get the minor tonic, uh, which is E minor. So it's very close to being a Phrygian flat two, five, one, but it just has that extra chord in there as, I don't know, like a bit of a treat, I guess. Hello. But let's leave it there. I'm done. I hope I've explained myself clearly enough through this. If you're not super into theory stuff, this might be a little bit beyond some people, but I think if you go through it a couple times and you do have an instrument, just listen to and play along with some of the examples I've given, which are listed in the comments below, and you'll start to get them. If you have any questions, please ask. And of course, as ever, if you have any disagreements, I don't care. I'm, I'm joking. Please, if you do disagree with anything I'm saying, just say below and tell me where you think I've gone wrong. Uh, there's also going to be a short little video uh, looking closely at a Beach Boys song, of course, uh, in terms of 251s. So we'll look up for that one. It'll be out soon. Uh, the song is an underrated classic. It's Breakaway. Um, watch this space. Anyway, don't forget to subscribe and like and comment and share and all that stuff. Thank you for watching.